The session will be a little bit more informal. I, I hope the whole week is somewhat informal. Our vision for the church is, uh, as a church, our local church, is very much that our gatherings are informal, as they would have been if Jesus was around. No, you know, sense of rigidness and tightness. I think that's what the synagogue meetings were like, where the Pharisees ran the meetings, and if you were a little kid and you misbehaved, you got called up and <laughs> punished or something. And then I picture Jesus' church meetings like this, where it's very informal. Somebody asked a question, and he would answer. And all of a sudden, a little kid comes, runs up. And the disciples were used to the uptight Pharisees. And they thought, oh, this is Jesus, man. We've got to make sure the kids don't distract him. You remember that story? Matthew 18. And Jesus said, no, let the little children come. Because if we don't have room for children in the church, you're not going to fit in in heaven. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Our vision in the church here, I believe the true new covenant church, must be one in which everybody is comfortable. Not irreverent and not distracting. And if there are children who are crying or being a distraction, we do take them out. But children who can feel at home and, and can grow up learning to love the church. I was blessed to grow up in a church where I loved it. I didn't want to be anywhere else. Really, for me, it was the funnest place to be, even sitting in a church meeting listening to, I didn't always pay attention, but I, the, the church culture that was established was one of, this is a fun place to be. These are the people you want to enjoy hanging out with, and I'm thankful for that. And what brought me here to Colorado years ago was to be a part of establishing that same vision where my children too would grow up, and they, we're going to church meeting, yay! That response rather than, ah, again, <laughs> you know. We've got a conference. We'll be there all day. And they look forward to that. <laughs> In fact, they're back there right now. They, they wouldn't rather be anywhere else. This is their, sometimes I feel like this is their first home. They'd rather be here than even in my own house. <laughs> so, um, so, so our, our, the culture we try to foster in our church meetings is one where there's, it's informal. There's an order to it. We do plan. We don't come here saying, hey, anybody got a word? No, I didn't have time to prepare. We're not deceiving ourselves that we're so led by the Spirit that that can happen. So we do have organization, but we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide. There are clear roles, just like in the home, you expect mom to cook the meal. Now, she might say, hey, you're an older son or an older child, you can cook the meal too. But you're not showing up at dinner time expecting somebody to all of a sudden whip it together. There's a sense of planning. So when you think about the church, think about the family, think about how things work in your family as you grow up. There's no sense of, nobody's special, you know. We don't think mom's such a special person just because she cooks the meal. In fact, you, you're thankful for her. And you know she works the hardest. And it's just like that. Why do we have elders in our churches? Because we're called to be the servants of all. That's why we have elders in our churches. Somebody has to be the servant. There's a, um, there's a sign, I think it was Harry S. Truman, who was the 33rd president of this country, who had a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here. There's a phrase that's saying the buck stops here means that, okay, if somebody else didn't do their job, the person who's responsible for him said, hey, why didn't your guy do his job or her job? It says, okay, well, if he doesn't answer, there's a chain of command. Ultimately, you can blame so-and-so, you blame your boss, blame your boss, blame your boss, and the person to take the blame at the end is the president. It's not really like that. Unfortunately, the culture in the United States over the last few years has become where the president blames everybody else, not the other way around. But in the church, the spirit of eldership and the spirit of Jesus Christ is this, I'll take the blame. If the Lord ever calls any of you men to be elders in churches, I hope you will have this spirit, I'll take the blame. If something didn't happen, it's on me. Not it's on them, hey, why didn't you do it, why didn't you do that? If you want to be an effective father and mother, if you want to be a godly husband and wife have this mentality I'll take the blame because that's the Spirit of Christ you know that verse 2 Corinthians 5 this is what you and I must be ambassadors of it's a good verse to know you're an, an ambassador on this earth dear young adults 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 we are ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is one who is a representative of one country in another country. The ambassador of India to the United States 
has an office in Washington, D.C. He's an Indian citizen representing the Indian government, but he lives in the United States. This is his home, quote unquote. He may even own a home here, but his real home is India because he's representing that country. Likewise, America has ambassadors in other countries. We are ambassadors because our citizenship is in heaven. You know that. Our, we're, that's our home. We're here representing the kingdom of heaven. And we're ambassadors. God says, I can't be on the earth. Jesus says, I can't be on the earth anymore. So you must be on the earth representing me. Speak on my behalf. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What does that mean? Most people don't understand what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. They think, I want to be a preacher. I want to be a healer. I want to have a big ministry. I want to be a pastor. All these things. No. Back up. Um, actually, it's, so you can read the previous verses. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. But the ambassadorship is in the next verse. This is what we are an ambassador of. Verse 21. He, God the Father, made him Jesus the Son. Okay? The Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. This is what you're an ambassador of. You're saying Jesus Christ started the ball rolling of saying, I'll take the blame. And He took the blame for our sin. He knew no sin. He didn't even know what sin felt like. You and I know that. But He didn't even know that. He, he abstained from sin so wholeheartedly. You know what that means? Pause for a moment and think about this. That every time you and I choose to think of ourselves only, I please myself in this situation. Somebody said this to me, I'm going to get back at her. I'm going to get back at him because they did that to me. He couldn't even do that once. Young men, you see a pretty girl walking by. Maybe you lust, fall into that area of lust. and you, Man, I shouldn't have done that. You apologize. Jesus couldn't even do that. The pressure gets so much where you're facing some temptation. Maybe you're addicted to some, in some area and, or you gossip a lot. You have a tendency to gossip. The pressure builds up and finally you just give in and think, okay, I got it off. Now I'll reset. Jesus didn't have that option available to him. We do. But Jesus didn't. And the reason he didn't was because he was making a new and living way for us. He became sin who knew no sin so that you and I could have this option of having sinned so much that now we can come back to Jesus and say, I'm really sorry, please forgive me that I gave in again and again and again. Please set me free. And he will. But Jesus became sin who knew no sin. What I was getting at was that he started the ball rolling of what? Of saying, I'll take the blame. Now he's looking for you and I as his body. Not just to say thank you that I'll get to go to heaven. No. Make me a part of your work, Jesus, of taking the blame for others. Now, we can't take other people's sin. Please understand that clearly. Only Jesus Christ has taken our sin. But when somebody else doesn't do something, will you step up and say, Lord Jesus, you showed me the example of taking my blame. Now, can I take somebody else's blame? What I mean by that is if somebody doesn't do their work, I'm going to step in and do it. Let's say it's somebody's job to clean the toilet which we're going to assign you guys tasks. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> we're going to assign you other tasks to take out the garbage and stuff, not to clean the toilets. We have, we're thankful that there are brothers and sisters in this church that will do that. But let's say it was that, the dirtiest job, cleaning the toilet. And it's filthy and you're like, oh man, somebody else was supposed to do it. Team one was supposed to do it. I'm just picking on you guys. I don't really have anything. But team one didn't do it. Will team two step up and say, they didn't do it. We're not going to sit here and say, hey, it was their job. They should have. The world is full of such people. Say it was their job, they should have, and the job never gets done. And God is looking for a different kingdom of people who say, oh sure it was their job, but I'm a part of this body too. I'll step up. I'll do it. And team one will get the credit for it. On the chart it will say, team one was supposed to clean the toilet. The toilet is clean. Team one must have done it. And little did they know that you guys did it. This is how the church is built. Do you want to be a part of this work? That's what Jesus is looking for. People who will step up and say, I'm not want to get the credit. Jesus gets all the credit, but the job gets done. And if you want to be a part of that work, come, Jesus says, and be a part of building my church. That's my spiel. <laughs> okay. Didn't plan to say any of that. But there are a couple, well, one question. I'm not going to get to this question until, unless we run out of questions that you have. Anybody want to ask a question? Has the thoughts I've shared even here at the beginning stimulated something in your heart? 
any question. There's no, there's no wrong question. Yes, Alec. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. If you didn't hear it, here's the question. At which point do we take the Great Commission seriously? Given that Jesus, let's, let's look at the Great Commission. You should know this. The Great Commission consists of two parts. That's a good question, Alec. Thank you. Uh, Mark chapter 16. I'll start there. Mark 16, verse 15. Both instances. It's not two separate times. It's one event. But Matthew and Mark record it slightly differently with different emphases. So it's good to know both parts of it. And it's very important, before I go into showing you the, the two parts of the two commission, it's like two sides of a coin. One easy way to know if you've been get, slipped a fake $100 bill is to look at both sides. <laughs> if you get a one-sided $100 bill, you don't even have to look any further. Don't have to hold it up to the light. It's guaranteed to be a fake. The counterfeiter wasn't even diligent enough to fake both sides of it. <laughs> That's easy, right? So. If you're being presented a gospel by preachers or by, the, by people around you that only presents one side of the Great Commission, just reject it immediately. Not reject the one side, but reject that bill and find one that has both sides. So the, every truth in Scripture you'll find has a balance to it. And this Mark's expression of the Great Commission expresses one side of the coin of the great, what we call the Great Commission, which is Jesus sending us out to fulfill our calling on this earth as His body. The first part of that is this, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This side of the coin of the Great Commission, speaking about frontier evangelism, taking the gospel into areas where it has not been preached. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation and baptize them. And they will, uh, he who believes shall be saved. And in this frontier evangelism, we do see things like casting out of demons, speaking in new tongues, picking up serpents, drinking deadly poison, etc., etc. And this is not something where you go looking for it. And people misunderstand it. They go looking for a serpent to bite them to prove that they are part of the Great Commission. People have died doing that. Don't be a fool. Right? So if you're involved in this frontier evangelism, this sign will come behind you. If you're looking for something behind you and you're moving in this direction, you move, you're facing the wrong direction. And that's why people slip and fall. It says these signs will accompany you. That means they'll follow behind you. Let God be in the business of letting these signs accompany you, whether He gives you the gift of tongues or uh, casting out demons or serpents biting you or drinking deadly poison. Don't drink the deadly poison expecting the, to, for God to fulfill it. Don't tempt the Lord your God, Jesus said. So if you're involved in this and it's not your time to die and somebody slips you some poison and unknowingly you drink it, guess what? It's not going to affect you. God will protect you from that poison because it's not your time to die and you're involved in fulfilling this great commission. The signs will accompany you. So that is this frontier evangelism where people are being presented the gospel for the first time. The other part of it is in Matthew 28. Also towards the end, it's the same incident. At the same time, Jesus said this in its entirety. Mark captured part of it. Matthew captured the other part of it. And here he says in Matthew 28, at the same incident when Jesus was getting ready to be taken up, in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That's, again, repeating what, not repeating, but saying the same thing that Mark had also said. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew doesn't talk anything about the serpents and the poison and all that, but he does go on to say this second part of the coin, the second side of the coin is this. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So two sides of the Great Commission is, Present people salvation, teach them to be disciples. To, what does it mean to be a disciple? To obey all that Jesus commanded. And uh, just in passing, 
we, our focus as a church tends to be on the second side of the coin because we find that the vast majority of Christendom is only focusing on the first side of the coin. Going here, going here, tell people, tell people, tell people, tell people, and then leave them sort of as orphans. And if that's all you're doing, that's only one side of the coin. We do both. We want to tell as many people as possible. That's part of why we do these conferences. We want to reach out. We have a web ministry. We broadcast our sermons and, and give tracts and do whatever. We do focus, we do emphasize the one side. We do uh, live out that first side, I should say. But our focus tends to be on the second side, which is the discipleship aspect of it. Because we live in a nation, in a country, where almost everybody has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's not the pure gospel, but at least they've been told Jesus Christ is the way of salvation, and they've chosen to reject it. So we say, let's find those who have, he have heard the gospel, let's show them the true gospel, and let's teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded us to do. And that's why we're searching the scriptures and saying, Lord, show us what is it we should be doing. When should you start the Great Commission? The reason Jesus didn't mention the Great Commission until the very end was because they didn't have the ability to fulfill it. This is one of the most important aspects of fulfilling the Great Commission is what Jesus goes on to say a few sentences later, even though it's a few pages over in your Bible, in Acts chapter 1. So you have to, you know, you put these all together in chronological order. You see that Jesus was saying this and what Mark said and what Matthew said happened at the same moment in time. And a few seconds later in the context of that same speech or conversation, Jesus said these words in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel and these signs will accompany you. And part two is... Uh, teach them to obey, observe all that I commanded you to do. And how will you do that? He says in Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You shall fulfill the Great Commission. So you see how Mark, Matthew and Luke who wrote the book of Acts have all captured the Great Commission in a sense in those three parts. So think about these three parts of the Great Commission. Preach the gospel, present it to all the nations, if you hear somebody, if you know of somebody that hasn't heard the gospel, doesn't know that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation, go tell them. Find a way. Ask God to help you tell them. But it, that also means teaching them to be disciples. How will you do it? Ask God to fill you with the power of, your, of His Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit, seek for it because you want to fulfill, fulfill the Great Commission. So, receive being power of the Holy Spirit. The reason, and here I'm getting to your question, Alec, is that the reason Jesus didn't mention about the Great Commission until that point was because he was the only one capable of fulfilling it at that time. Because to truly fulfill the, the, the Great Commission, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, for the 33 and a half years that he was here, was the only human being that was ever full of the Holy Spirit inside for those full 33 years. So if he had told the disciples at the age of 30, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he says, okay, let's go. But they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. And they would have destroyed God's purpose. They would have worked against God's purpose in building the kingdom. So he told them at the end, when he was just about to go up, he says, listen, go fulfill the commission, but wait. Wait until you've received power through the Holy Spirit and then fulfill my commission. So the answer then is, when, should we, when, when, is, when are you ready to fulfill the great commission? As soon as you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When should you be filled with the Holy Spirit? What do you think? Tonight? Close. Right now. You don't have to wait till I'm done talking. You don't even have to close your eyes and get on your knees. Do that too when you, when you have the time. But while you're sitting there and you hear, and if the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to you of what I'm talking about, and you find a burning passion within you, let the cry, the silent cry of your heart be, Lord, fill me right now. Because I do want to fulfill this great commission. I don't want to waste my life. This phrase has been running through my mind this last few days in thinking about this conference. Live today with the perspective you will have 10 seconds after you die. Let me say that again. Live today with the perspective you will have 10 seconds after you die. I'll tell you, dear young adults, 10 seconds after you die, this, your thoughts will change dramatically. I mean, you think she's cute right now. You think you'll even be thinking about that 10 seconds after you die? You think he's handsome and you, you wish you guys could get together. But you think 10 seconds after you die that will even matter? 
when you're standing face to face before your Savior and, in the, and you see His glory and your eternity is, is there before you, you have the option. It's a choice. God won't force you to do it. But you have the option of living today with that perspective. And yes, God wants you to be married. God wants you to have a job and all of those things. But the dominating perspective is this. I am going to stand before my God one day. And I want to live today with that perspective that I will have. I said 10 seconds. Really, it'll be like a second. In the twinkling of an eye, you'll be dead and alive there. Or Jesus will come and you'll be raptured with him. I don't know. I'm, I'm preferring the second option. I want to be raptured. I want to be here when Jesus comes. But if he calls me home before that, that's fine. But either way, what should matter to me is, here's, here's the end of my life. I don't know where that is. It could be tonight. It could be 20 years from now. It could be 50 years from now. I don't know. But I want what's on the other side of this. I want to, I want to live here now. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is John 3 verse 16. You know the verse, right? Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but go to heaven. See, that's what you're hearing in, in Christendom today. No. But have eternal life. When does eternal life begin for you? Now. Don't wait for after you die. If eternal life has already begun for you because you're born again. If you're not born again, my dear brother, sister, don't wait a moment further. Be born again today, right now, right after this meeting or sometime. Do it by yourself. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell Phil or Sandeep or anybody else. Just do it, Jesus. Tell Him. If, if, you, if you want to come share with us or share with your friends that you're born again, that's wonderful. We'll rejoice with you. But the moment you're born again, eternity begins. Because your life, your God is starting to put His eternal life within you. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now on this earth, and if you have eternal life now because you're born again, where are you dwelling? You're already dwelling 10 seconds after you die, and you won't be shocked. The Bible talks about some who will shrink away when they see Jesus, and others that will just jump into His arms. Don't assume you will jump into His arms. If you're living today with that perspective of 10 seconds after you die, when you see Him, it'll just be an, a natural transition, because you were all dwe always dwelling in eternity. But if you're living for yourself, pleasing yourself, um, carrying on those habits and those thoughts and those ways of living your life that are self-centered, self selfish, all about me, all about me, all about me, and then you see Jesus and all of a sudden you're shocked and realize He was all about you and you were all about you and the two have nothing to do with each other. And you will shrink back and you will hide and it'll be like your clothes were stripped away and you're standing there naked and everybody sees. And your Savior Himself who saw it all along but the whole world will see you for the selfish, self-centered person you were. Now I'm not pointing a finger at you, I'm pointing a finger at myself. I'm, I'm hoping to inspire myself a little bit more even by sharing these thoughts with you that that's where God wants you to live now. Ten seconds after you die. What will this thing that captivates you so much right now, this sport or this thing, I love sports, you know, you see how I am, but I'm never going to let it captivate me in a way that distracts me from living on the other side of the end of my earthly existence. We're out of time. You have another question? <laughs> I'll take one quick one if you have one. Yes, Michael. Yeah. The discipline of the Lord, Hebrews chapter 12, you can look at it sometime. All whom I love, I discipline, Jesus says. Hebrews chapter 12. Everybody knows Hebrews chapter 11, right? Wonderful chapter of faith. Very few people know Hebrews chapter 12 because it talks about the discipline of the Lord. The discipline just means the spanking of the Lord. Um, and uh, and uh, so he says in verse, you read those chapters sometimes, it's in the context of saying Jesus was the first one who was disciplined by his father. He made himself in a position where he could get, not spankings really, but just discipline. And I want to say something real quickly about that. I've written a short article about it. I think it's on our website somewhere a while back. I wrote the difference between punishment and discipline. Very important for you to understand that. God is not going to punish you if you're a child of his. He will punish sinners. But for the, all of you who have received forgiveness of your sins through faith in Jesus Christ, where did your punishment go? Who got the spanking for you? Jesus did on the cross. 
He took that spanking for you for three hours, which is an eternity for an eternal God. He got your spanking. And oh, it was not just a spanking. It was eternal hell that he suffered on the cross. So now God, having punished his only son on your behalf, is not going to punish you again for your sin. Even the sin that you just committed or will commit tonight. But he wants to discipline you. And there's a difference in my, this is how I understand it. Punishment is past focused. You did that, so you must be punished now. You kill that person, you're going to jail. You stole that, you're going to jail. There, there's no sense of forward looking. Now, even in the world, there's a little bit of both. Punish, uh, discipline is a little bit different. Punishment is past focused. You did that wrong, you need to get a punishment for it. Jesus took that. That's why your past is never of any consequence if you're a child of God. Jesus has taken your punishment. Now the future though. Now you have to learn how to live this life, to live free from sin and to be set free, sanctified. And along that way, God wants you to come to this life where you're increasingly being set free from sin. And so he disciplines you. By what? He allows you to not get the job you want. He allows that, man, that boy or that girl that you thought you were going to marry to marry somebody else. He allows, as much as you're convinced that this car is the right one for you, He allows your daddy, whom you're asking for a loan, to say, No. <laughs> no, you're not ready to have a car yet, perhaps. Um, he allows you to... Um, I don't know, give me some more examples. I've set you uh, the tone. How has the Lord disciplined some of you? Tell me. Or have you seen others being disciplined? A hard boss? Yeah. A boss who's just mean, just yells at you, picks on you for no reason, picks on every little thing that you do. This is the Lord's discipline. Parents, I'm sorry? Takes a long time. Yeah, oh sure. It takes a long time to answer a prayer. Some of you have been praying to get married for like six months. <laughs> what a long time to wait. <laughs> And he's like, Lord, I've been waiting six months. Where's that girl? Where's that boy? No, you know I'm being half kidding. But yeah, if it seems like he takes a long time to answer some prayers, that's the Lord's discipline. Yes? Would you say that the discipline of the Lord also parallels, parallels testing of your faith? Yes, it sure does. Absolutely. The discipline of the Lord is to test our faith. Why? Because it's an excellent point, Emma, because Hebrews chapter 12 comes after Hebrews chapter 11. He's raised the standard of faith and he says, now listen, where you'll need this faith, where Jesus is your perfect example, is when he disciplines you. And you say, Lord, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, but I'm trusting you. And if you don't have faith, I'm so glad you said that. If you don't have faith in the midst of Jesus' discipline, the Father's discipline, you will just give up. I'll share one closing word with you. Uh, so those are some examples, Michael. I'm sure you can think of others. Those difficult circumstances in life, essentially. Uh, Luke 22. Frustration in circumstances. He'll allow you to go fishing and he knows you're not going to catch anything. And he'll wait till 7 a.m. to show up. Discipline. Jesus knew that the fish, uh, Peter and the boys were going to go fishing at, I don't know, when, long before they planned to go fishing. And they went out at 6 p.m. How long should I wait? Jesus says, and the father says, eh. Give them about 12 hours. <laughs> Let them fish all night. And then they're just done, dead beat. He says, okay. Jesus knew this was going to happen to Peter, this testing of his faith. And he knew he was going to go through the Father's discipline. He says, Luke 22, verse 31. Peter, Peter, Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Sometimes, guess what? The Father will also, this is the beautiful thing about the Father we serve. The God we serve, He's our Father. He can take what the devil does. See, the devil is in the business of doing horrible stuff to you. He's, he wants, he's got the worst possible plans for you. You know, you take Je Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Behold the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and your calamity and reverse it. You ever do that sometimes? This is, what, this is the devil's Bible. Behold the plans I have for you. Plans for your calamity. Plans to just give you the worst possible life. This is the devil planning it. And you think, God, destroy his plans. But you know, the Lord doesn't always do that. He sometimes allows the devil's plans to bear fruit. A great example of that is Job. But what does God do? He says, listen, 
I am so big. You guys, just trust me, all right? The devil's going to do that to you. He's going to bring some sickness. He's going to allow that circumstance in your life. He's going to allow you to be abused and misused and taken advantage of in some way. And it's from the devil. It's not from your father. But in the midst of that, I'm going to take that and turn it into good. And to take all, that, all the crushing that the devil tries to bring into your life and bring something beautiful out of it. Just trust me for it. So you must have faith. Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, to shake you, to shake the ground you're standing on, to shake everything about what you're doing. I have prayed for you that you will not be sifted. No, that's not what Jesus is praying for. Jesus is in heaven saying, put your name there. Santosh, Santosh. Satan has demanded permission to shift you, sift you like wheat. But he's up there at the right hand of the Father praying for you. What? That your faith will not fail. Verse 31, verse 32. So that once you are turned again, you will strengthen your brother and sister. And I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm sitting here with you as a testimony. Uh, this is my testimony as well. Satan demanded permission to sift me like weed. He still is. But Jesus was praying for me that my faith would not fail. And I'm thankful that I'm still standing here today trusting my Father in heaven. But having repented, having turned, I'm here to strengthen you, my brothers and sisters. I'm fulfilling this verse. So that one day, after you've gone through your, as you go through your testing and trial, you too will sit in my seat or wherever the Lord places you and encourage your brother, your sister. Encourage those around you because they're all going through testings as well. I have to end. Well, you can ask the other questions to fill in some. Father, I pray that you will challenge us afresh, Lord, with your will for our lives. Thank you that you love us. Your plans are for our welfare, not for our calamity. And as calamitous as the plans the devil has for us, you're turning them all into good. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Therefore, what shall we say? If God is for us, who shall be against us? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing at all. Thank you, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.